we're bad at podcasting. Um, <laughs> I think how it goes is you say, welcome to the show. And then you say the person's name. I don't know. Matthew, do you want to? No, you do that. You're good. at. So we're joined by Bridget Cambria. She's one of our colleagues, one of the smart ones, right, Matthew? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're one of the effective ones. Yeah. Smart and effective. Right. She's one of these people who you have to kind of go to once in a while just to find out like what the hell's going on, right? That's true. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, Bridget, what the hell's going on? Well, I mean, a lot's going on. We have a new administration and we're all wondering if it's going to be good or bad. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I think Matthew's typically irritated, mildly irritated or very, or just, you know, completely upset. But Mm -hmm. in, in the last week, they've been making some changes in the family detention system. So family detention is, you know, family prisons. It's where you hold families and children indefinitely in ICE prisons. So there's two in Texas and one in Pennsylvania. Family, family, family fun zones. (laughs) You know, they have Zumba class and there are some granola bars. Oh, yeah, there is coloring books. So I'm going to just take offense to the word, the P word that you use. (laughs) But so anyhow, go ahead. Oh, no. I mean, it's just a place where they hold a bunch of kids and families. And it's really what it is, is that they're deportation centers. So the point of family detention centers is not to orient you into the United States. It's a secure, unlicensed detention facility for parents and children with the purpose of deporting you. So who ends up in these places? These are like drug dealer moms and they're crack babies, right? No. These nope. are no, no, these are nonviolent asylum seeking yeah. families. And, you know, regardless of that, that doesn't matter. Right. right Immigration right. is civil. We all know that we shouldn't detain anyone. And we certainly shouldn't detain grandmothers, mothers, infants. I mean, we shouldn't do any of that. But the purpose of a family detention center is to make it colorful And to make it seem like it's an okay place, but it's not. It's a secure, unlicensed facility where parents and children cannot leave. They can't even leave to get ice cream with their attorney, which is what Matthew really wanted to do. Right. At work, but you can't do that. I wrote a letter. It was rebuffed. I think they said no. (laughs) They were claiming, and they probably still do, that it's an unsecured facility. Right. Families are free to come and go as they please. So I (laughs) I asked if I could take them out for ice cream. And apparently, the coming and going as a please part is not exactly how we envision coming and going. But you got the they wrong as they please means like they're superiors <laughs> at ERO. But let me ask you this, because I have a lot of asylum seeking clients mm-hmm. who presented themselves at the border or were apprehended at the border from 2013 to present. And most of them spent some time in a processing facility of some sort at the border and then we're just let go or paid bond and so i'm still after all these years a little confused about like why one family would be sent to a facility and told like you can't get out and then others are just sort of like whatever how are these decisions being made it's completely random i call it a bad lottery because and believe me it's a question we get a lot of times from parents you know, why am I here? And there's only so many beds in a family detention center. So there's only so many people they can detain. So it's really the ones that CBP chooses randomly and in their discretion to send to family detention. So you'll have a bunch of families that present for asylum, say 10, one, one will be chosen to go to a family detention center. Because I mean, most of my clients, for example, end up here because they present not a formal sponsor, but somebody that they can be released to. Right. So it's not like the people in family detention are ones who don't have contacts. These are people with contacts in the U.S., right? Yeah, that's the, typically the number one question from people that don't know anything about family detention is why? Well, where would they go? They all have families to go to. They all have sponsors, quote unquote sponsors, friends or family who are willing to receive them. And in the rare case, and and it is rare, where a family has nowhere to go, there are communities always willing to receive them. We just call and they're received. 
So we have never had a person, for example, that just had to be in a family detention center because they had nowhere to go. That's never happened. So one thing for maybe newer listeners, the family detention has been around for quite a while. So I know I started working on it and Bridget started working on it when Obama was president. And it existed prior to Obama as well. Mm -hmm. Prior to Obama, it was generally people would come in, they would be there for a little bit of time to secure their sponsors and make sure they had a safe place to go and whatnot. It was really kind of uh, served as a transition. And they were released. Under Obama, what they started to do is what Bridget just described, is holding people for deportation. So it turned into kind of a way station and it turned into an indefinite detention facility for usually families with children. And a deportation case doesn't take three days. Not that that would make it right to detain them, but I mean, how long are these cases taking in your guys' experience? Well, in the beginning when Matthew was there, they were holding them for the entirety of removal proceedings. So the families were there about a year, a year and a half, two years. Then they started to detain families who, for example, filed federal lawsuits against the government as a means of punishing them. And they were detained upwards of two years. But the newest iteration that happened at the end of the Obama administration and the Trump administration was the application of expedited removal to all families that entered family detention. And that required that they undergo credible fear. And if any attorney listening, and I hope some are, that in the Trump administration, credible fear became entirely difficult. It was like a flipped switch. We saw around the summer of 2019. Credible fear passage rates, which is basically the fear that someone has to establish to just see a judge, to just obtain some access to courts, go from a 90% passage rate to a 10% passage rate. So our facility started to fill up with negative credible fears based entirely on the, like, f***ing up the asylum system, which is what they did. Mm -hmm. And so then you saw, again, another year and a half to 18 months of families being detained based on these improper determinations. So it's just been iteration after iteration after iteration of families screwed over, placed in these facilities, and then held forever. Right. What I always thought was the most troublesome or the most psychologically traumatizing for these families was not ever having an idea of when they would get out. Yeah. And and always being told, well, you are going to get out, but it's going to be back to your home country. So it's complete, it's completely different if they know, okay, well, we're going to be in here for a short period of time. We're going to be released to family here. It still sucks. It's not good. But the psychological trauma that I think was inflicted was horrible. And then of course the parents, they feel guilty for having their children, you know, subjecting their children to all that. It's just a horrible system. And we were hoping during the Obama administration, someone would listen, right? And it was horrible, the response we got from that administration. And then I know in Pennsylvania, with Governor Wolf, we thought, okay, maybe when Trump comes in, he'll do the whole, like, own the conserves, you know, how they own the libs, and he'll be like, yeah, we'll just shut down Burks. But he didn't do that. So people love family detention. And now... You can tell us what's going on now, but we kind of see what's going on at the border in the Biden fanboys and girls um, are now starting to sound just like they did during the Obama administration. So, but we do have positive stuff from family detention. So why don't we talk about that? Sure. I'm not going to be a cheerleader. I'm not going to cheer the, no, I'm not going to cheer on the administration for. Should we point out your Biden hat, Biden Harris hat that you're wearing right now, or <laughs> there is it's an audio only podcast. I don't know if we should be the um, with her t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. I mean, you're never going to get a cheerleader out of me to congratulate the administration on not detaining children forever and instead detaining children for a short period of time. Children should never be detained. It's not okay. But I will tell you that within the past week, the administration has adopted or is beginning to adopt a different policy or perspective towards family detention. And the only reason that we know this is that 
ICE who will not talk to legal service providers for some reason, but they will talk to LOP providers, indicated that they were changing the Texas facilities into what they're going to call, quote unquote, reception centers to receive families and promptly release them. And what I think is the best thing that was written in that announcement was that they're no longer, at least now, this could change, going to subject families to expedited removal, credible fear in detention. And that's what keeps families there. That's what creates it to be a deportation mill. That's probably the worst thing possible in our family detention system up till today. Now, changing a former male prison and a giant $270 million secure family detention center into a reception center to me is ridiculous. They're owned by for-profit prisons. They're operated by for-profit personnel. They maintain offices of ICE. So the people that are deporting children are still the people caring for children. I mean, it's hard to be received by the person that wants to send you to die. So, I mean, really, I hope this is just one first step into reimagining how we're going to welcome and receive families into the United States. But that's what happened this week. And then I work in Pennsylvania, so obviously I'm entirely focused on the Berks County Residential Center, which is the family detention center here in Berks. It's the smallest, but it's the most loved by immigration, I think. And we thought that we would be ignored. But as of this morning, there was a mass exodus of all detained families from the Berks County Residential Center. So as of noontime today, there are zero people there. Now, no. now wait, 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 wait. It can be terrifying. Or it can be hopeful. The terrifying part is what the hell's coming, right? The hopeful part is we have a weekend off, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking is coming that makes you scared? I've heard lots of rumors. I mean, you, let's hear them. Oh, and then I don't know. I don't have really good sourcing. So it would just be, you know, I'm a lawyer. We deal in facts. So I can't tell you anything. If a rumor is stated on a podcast that no one listens to, is it even a rumor? I think there's what a... What your fear be? My fear yeah. from the rumors. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll tell you my fear. And it's because of just continuously and continuously receiving families that are detained long term. In the announcement that was written up in a Texas newspaper, it specifically didn't include Burks in their announcement. And the announcement was we're ending long-term family detention. So if they're ending long-term family detention in Texas, what are they going to do here? I fear that they would use this facility to detain people long-term. That's always my fear. But today, not today. Yeah. So they would have to fill it back up first. Have to fill it back up first. And I'm hopeful that maybe the governor will prevent that from happening. What do you think, Matthew? No, I don't think that's going to happen. That's no. definitely not going to happen now. No, but I'll tell you how interesting it was because, you know, maybe your listener is interested. But I got, the, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, it's the female right? Just one. Yeah, it's her and her children. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. She makes her children listen to. So the, the families themselves today did not know that they were being released. So the detained families themselves didn't know. What happened was last night, family members were called by immigration officials to provide travel arrangements or to pick them up the next morning. And every single family was taken from the facility and released to their family members by noon and no later than noon. I think that's pretty remarkable and shows that they can actually release people if they want to. I mean, the biggest thing that really, you know, me off is that for years and years and years, The line by immigration is always, we can't do it. The law doesn't let us. Our hands are totally tied. Hands are totally tied. How many emails have you gotten? Sorry, you're mandatory, quote unquote, right? Or you can't be released. It's like the flip of a switch. I filed a parole request for one family less than a week ago. It was denied. But today, it's okay today. So Bridget, Joe Biden calls you up and he says, no, I was listening to Redirect. My favorite podcast. I heard you on there. I heard you have some big ideas. I'm I can tell you're a huge fan. <laughs> I heard about your hat. Thanks so, for being our biggest cheerleader. 
I'm going to put you in charge as to what to do for both unaccompanied minors and families that come in through our southern border. Oh, that's like the hardest question, right? I look on Twitter and I see so many different answers, all of which are wrong. The only person, <laughs> the only person that has the right answer is probably um, Holly Cooper, who we yes. all should listen to. I don't know anyone else that has the right answer. No, I think that there's a, you know, the whole kids in cages debate is, it really is just an awful debate to have because it's really any child in confinement, right, is a kid in a cage. So to sort of be like, well, these cages are okay and these are not, that's just ridiculous. The difference is, is that, and this is the difference that people that are on the Biden side will say is, well, this is in the realm of health and human services and not ICE which is extremely important. In family detention, ICE is the custodian. That's the big problem. Like ICE shouldn't be the custodian of any child. Would you give them your children? I mean, I've, I've tried to give them Stephen's children. <laughs> I mean, Apparently, I, I, they're so against, yeah. I mean, you know, they were crying the other day in the background. We we're doing the podcast. So I called up ICE and they're like, we can't do that. So that was. I mean, me. but it's just not their job. Right. right. That's not what they're experts at. They, you know. well, we have had problems with health and human services as of well. Course, right? Of course. But the two facilities that are at issue right now is Homestead and Carrizo Springs. I think that's how you say it. They're unlicensed. Right. So, I mean, they've had decades to figure out how to house unaccompanied minors in proper facilities and treat them properly. And they've been subject to constant litigation about the mistreatment of children in their care, whether it's medicating them when they don't need medicine, trying medicine out on them when they don't need medicine, different types of abuse. I mean, ORR has its litany of problems, but at the same time, they've had time after time after time to address the system. They know that this is happening. So why are they doing nothing to fix it? And the fix is definitely not reopening a facility where abuse occurred before that's still unlicensed. And also, I believe somebody's on the board that shouldn't be. And then Carrizo Springs, which is also not a licensed facility. So when you're not licensed, there's no oversight. The federal government can't oversee its own treatment of children. That's why you need these facilities to be licensed so that there's oversight by someone else. And do I have the answer? No, but there are really smart people that are paid a whole lot of money to figure this out. And I'll tell you what, if we stopped funding these militarized equipment and certain border functions and put that money where Congress actually intended it to be to the care of children, we'd probably have a lot more resources that are more appropriate. And the number one thing is to just not keep kids in detention. So the fix for ORR is to do what you're supposed to do and release a child to their custodian in a timely manner without unnecessary delay. That's what the requirement yeah. is. So the big concern from people who are not really concerned is human trafficking of the children. How do we know they're not going to human traffickers and all that? Mm -hmm. And that's generally espoused by people you know don't really care, like Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram and, and people yeah. like that. I wonder if they address those same concerns in their own communities with child welfare, because our child welfare in our states don't hold on to kids for 10 months when they know where their parents are, right? There's a system in place where they evaluate and they do it quickly and they place a child quickly. There's no difference from an American child to a child seeking protection in the United States or an unaccompanied child. They should be considered with the same haste. So all of the things that have to be done can be done quickly. I'll give you a good example. The Clint facility, which was really when the kids in cages debate was like at the highest level, those kids in those facilities were unaccompanied, but the kids each had a wristband that was a certain color and a green wristband meant you had a parent in the United States. Okay. So children with green wristbands that had a parent in the United States, they would write the parent's name and phone number on the wristband and put you in the CBP facility where you would be kept for days and days and days. So we found one of these kids, Amy Maldonado, actually, myself and Rapid Defense Network, who was a seven-year-old girl who had a green wristband whose parents were in Washington who wanted to have her released to them. So we're like, just call the number on the wristband. And this is real easy, CBP, you know. Here's the flight. She can go meet her parents. 
it was denied. We had to go to federal court to get that girl from that place to her biological parents' wife. I remember listening to the judge in the court and the government's response was, well, we'll release the child in the normal course. And the judge is like, what do you mean release? She's seven. What does release mean? And the lawyer had no idea how to respond to that because the judge is like, how do you release a seven-year-old from what? What are you releasing the seven-year-old from? And that child- It's not, it's not the P word, that's for sure. No. Not prison. No. <laughs> But, but she was very rapidly, only because of a judge, sent to her parents. There's so much bureaucracy in the system to reunite a child with a family member, a child with a sponsor. And you're right. I mean, I guess you have to consider the evil that could potentially happen to a child, right? Well, that's why you fund it. Right. So where are the experts doing these things? There should be no minimum on the amount of money that we're providing to make sure kids are safe, because we certainly don't have that same hesitation when we're talking about like tanks on the border or something like that. Well, it's the value judgment, right? If the value judgment is that these children should be in a safe environment that is not a jail or a prison or a detention facility, that these should be in a safe environment with family, we can do it, right? I mean, it's something that I think we as a nation have the capabilities of doing. But the value judgment for way too long has been to ensure their removal. Removal is based over safety. And all the people that will come out and talk about human trafficking and all that, they are not concerned with the child because if they had a choice, that child would be sent back unaccompanied back to Honduras or Guatemala with no concern of that child. So it's going to be interesting to see how they proceed. But I think it's important that we as advocates, especially people that are effective like you, Bridget, keep pushing them and holding them to account. I'm only effective here, like <laughs> here in Pennsylvania. There's no one else here. Um, <laughs> so that's why. Exactly. exactly. All the other lawyers <laughs> out there. <laughs> not, not so good. One last thing, I guess, I've been thinking a lot about recently is just we've had some cancellation of removal cases where we've ended up focusing sort of on the trauma of the encounter with ICE, which by the time of the individual hearing often happened like four or five years ago as sort of the root of the hardship. And so I've been studying more and more just the long-term effects of detention or having your parent taken out of the car when she's driving you to school by ICE and disappeared for weeks or, or whatever. And It's in everybody's best interest if we can just treat people right. You know, these things echo through generations when we allow people to be treated this way. I just, I can't even imagine having to go through these kinds of things. And so, yeah, anybody who's fighting to make sure that kids don't have to be separated from their parents or detained for long periods of time is fighting the good fight, I say, so. Well, imagine the trauma to a child instead of just having the parent picked up, what if they both are? So, I mean, the other awful thing about having family detention centers is it permits the interior enforcement of ICE raids against children. So we've had kids picked up on their way to school with their parents. We've had kids literally carried out of beds while sleeping by ICE officers while taking their parent as well. We've had kids disappeared and so traumatized that they will start breaking down because they're going to miss school and they don't understand why they can't just go to school and their homework assignment's going to be late and they start panicking that their homework assignment's going to be late. The effects of detention on adults is outrageously crazy, but Matthew hit it on the head. The unknowing what's going to happen to you, to a child, is more than traumatizing. It's torture. Kids in family detention centers watch their friends get taken out in the middle of the night and sent to a place where they think they're going to die. So when they see their friends being taken, they believe they're dead or disappeared. In family detention, you as a parent don't get to choose how you raise your child. Somebody makes those decisions for you. If you want your child to get medicine, you don't make that choice. Somebody makes that for you. When your child wakes up, when they go to sleep, what they watch, what they eat, 
whether they're cared for, whether they're provided medicine, all of those decisions are made for them. So in family detention, the parent-child relationship is forever destroyed. And it's forever destroyed because when a child leaves family detention, they no longer trust their parent. The question is always, why can't we just take a walk, mom? Like, what did you do? So the trust is forever lost. And I'll tell you what, we've had parents call after detention where their children have become violent, where their children can't go into school buildings because it reminds them of prison. They feel like they're never going to leave. I mean, the effects of detention on this group of children for the last six years in family detention, we're not going to know yet. We're not going to know the effects that that had. And that's just the kids. The whole terrible part of family detention is not valuing the idea of a family. And in our society, the family is the quintessential element, you know, and people that are conservative often talk about families and how important that is and blah, blah, blah. And it only matters if it's a white family and not a brown or black family, but that's okay. But family is wholly important. And in family detention, you destroy that. And it's a farce. It's like a play. It's we're keeping them together. Look, look how great we are. They're a family. They're together. But a parent is not a parent there. And a child is not a child there. It's just a show. And Matthew's also right like a second time. The psychological (laughs) harm is almost worse than the physical harm. And they are stunted. Brain development stunted. Learning is stunted. You know, they lose weight, all of those things. But the maturity that you lose or just the love and understanding of what a parent-child relationship, it's forever gone. And, you know, you're talking about cancellation. I know you deal a lot with this, Stephen, and you have difficult judges, I believe, but we're not going to talk about that. But I I, I like them just fine. I think they're great. (laughs) No, they're great (laughs) judges, but I mean, you know, every place is more difficult. The hardship of losing a parent, I believe that that's not sufficient on its own, right? For cancellation, you have to show that something more. But the psychological harm of the tension and losing a parent, it's the destruction of the family. And family detention does that just the same. No different than adult detention. It just is colored. It has colorful walls or butterflies, but it's the same thing, the same place. That's what I see the discussion of these new, whatever they're calling these facilities, and they're showing the pictures inside of coloring books and all that. And they're like, this is not kids in cages. This is, you know, this is much better. And I know you can have like a superficial look at Burks and say, oh, it's not bad. I mean, that's not, you know, that looks just fine. They have a rec room and and all that. But it's so far beyond just what's painted on the walls and those things. So when I see that conversation coming around again, that's what gives me pause that this is just kind of a pause and that, you know, things won't go back. You're worried that this isn't going far enough or that they might revert back to the way things were. The one thing I will say, maybe we can try and end on a positive note, is, you know, we started this show in 2014, I want to say. And it felt like there were two people or three people in the world talking about this issue. (laughs) And nobody listened to this show. Nobody seemed to really care And now I am encouraged to see people that three or four years ago or six years ago weren't engaged with the immigration issue at all, you know, being outraged by what's going on. And the amount of engagement, I think, is really encouraging. And we need to just be encouraging people to continue to push because the thing that maybe more than anything that really... (laughs) blows my mind is what we mentioned earlier that all of this is just a choice the system works in a different way most of the time like you you can just let people go to their families and you can make those decisions and we know that because we do and when you understand like how arbitrary it is there's no justification for keeping it in place at that point Well, it's a financial interest dressed in a deterrent interest, supposedly, right? I mean, that's what they that's what they would say. And also a humanitarian, right? Right. I'm saying, but it's good chatting with both of you, Bridget. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming on, Matthew. Most definitely.